The Philippine development story started with this vision. By 2022, we would have reduced the poverty rate from 21.6% of the population to 14%. That means lifting 6 million Filipinos out of poverty. And we would have graduated to upper middle income country status with a gross national income of close to 4,000 US dollars per person per year, which will make us uh, rather in the same league of uh, countries like Thailand or China today. And by 2040, we would have eradicated extreme poverty where no one goes to bed hungry and graduate to become a high income country where Japan and South Korea are today. After only three years of the administration, the data came out to show that we have actually achieved the promise of lifting 6 million Filipinos out of poverty. The revised statistics show that in 2015, the poverty incidence was 23.5% of the population living below 60 pesos per person per day. That was the poverty line. In 2018, the poverty incidence improved to 16.7%, by far the biggest improve in our history in a three-year period, thereby lifting 6 million Filipinos out of poverty. And we continue to target 14% or lower by the end of the administration. The reason for this important achievement is that we have had significant progress in our zero to 10 point social economic agenda. The ones that you see in green have substantial achievement and we are working hard to deliver those that remain in the zero to 10 point social economic agenda. And I will explain the details in a while. All of these have resulted in significant gains for the economy and the people. Without doubt, COVID-19 is going to make our recovery challenging, but we have the solid fundamentals to address our ongoing challenges. We have one of the highest uh, growth uh, prior to COVID, uh, averaging 6.6% .6 between 2016 and 2019. Before COVID, we were likely to become an upper middle income country in 2020 or two years ahead of our target schedule of 2022. We achieved low and stable inflation. The average is exactly 3% enabled uh, partly by the rise tarification law. We have one of the strongest fiscal position prior to COVID, the highest revenue to GDP ratio and the lowest debt to GDP ratio, largely enabled by the tax reform and our fiscal prudence. We achieved one of the highest infrastructure spending in history. We achieved also the highest ever credit rating in the range of BBB plus to A minus. And as a result, the people benefited. We saw the lowest level of unemployment and underemployment prior to COVID. And as I mentioned, the lowest poverty incidence in our history. Let me now go through the details of the zero to 10 point socioeconomic agenda, focusing on some of the key accomplishments. The first is constraints to doing business have shifted dramatically from macroeconomic concerns to pandemic. In 2005, the World Bank did a survey and asked investors what were the severe constraints to doing business in the Philippines. Number one was macroeconomic instability. Number two, corruption. Number three, electricity. Many years later, 15 years later, we have addressed uh, very much macroeconomic instability. Our concerns right now are more structural and more on sustainability. And one of the important indicator of this is our improving credit rating, which have gone up from as low as BB minus uh, 10, 20 years ago to BBB plus. And this credit rating upgrade is not just about borrowing on cheaper terms. It means upgrading everyone's lives. Everyone who borrows for a housing loan, an auto loan, a personal loan, even credit card loans. And this means everyone has the opportunity to invest and to save. Our second progress is on tax reform. And our tax reform is not about raising revenues per se. It is about investing in our country's future. Because of a series of tax reform that we have done in the last five years, we have seen one of the highest 
tax to GDP and revenue to GDP ratio since 1997. And this is our insurance as we entered the unexpected COVID-19 pandemic. And some of the highlights of our tax reform are the landmark passage of the train law in 2017, which uh, reduces personal income tax and also broadens the tax base. We also passed the tax amnesty that covers estate tax and delinquency tax. We also passed two important excise tax reform, the tobacco excise, as well as the alcohol and e-cigarette excise taxes, which are largely funding our universal health care and helping people fund their expenses in this time of pandemic. We also passed the uh, landmark uh, CREATE bill, which reduces corporate income tax from 30 to as low as 20% to benefit even the smallest or the micro corporations. We have finally made, after more than 30 years, a performance-based, targeted, time-bound, and transparent fiscal incentives regime. We expect this to help in our pandemic recovery by allowing us to create at least 400,000 jobs over the next few years and to support 90,000 micro, small, and medium corporations. And we improve the governance by expanding the role of the Fiscal Incentives Review Board. On the ease of doing business, the ease of doing business law passed several years ago have allowed us to reduce the processing time when people apply for licenses. It uh, puts a maximum processing days, for instance, of three days for simple applications and uh, up to 45 days for applications that require approval of any sangunian. And this important reform have resulted in one of the biggest gain in our doing business indicator. In 2019, we ranked 124 out of 190 countries. By 2020, the, the latest survey, we have seen a 29 notch improvement to 95th place. And we will continue to do better to achieve a lower and more competitive ranking. Number four is infrastructure spending. From less than 100 billion peso when we started this um, century, we have ramped up infrastructure spending to over a trillion peso in 2019. And we continue to catch up in 2021 with the highest ever infrastructure spending of 1.17 trillion peso. And we will continue to do so until we complete the promises in the Build, Build, Build program. Of course, in 2020, uh, the pandemic and our reprioritization has temporarily, only temporarily, reduced our infrastructure spending. But we continue to catch up starting this year. The most important indicator is not the amount spent, but the number of jobs created. The, um, the full-time equivalent of jobs is expected to reach 1.7 million full-time equivalent jobs in 2021 because of the infrastructure program. And this is much bigger than less than uh, 1 million and as low as 100,000 uh, 10 or 20 years back. On number five, on rural development, one of our landmark reform is a rice tarification law. It has benefited farmers through the Rice Competitiveness Enhancement Fund with an annual guarantee of 10 billion pesos more for the next six years, plus any excess revenue from the tariff on rice. And the result as of last year has been very encouraging. The RCEF achievements in the past two years include the distribution of millions of inbred seeds of higher yield, of farm machineries, and also a significant amount of budget that is targeted to help farmers become productive. Before RCEF, the yield was 3.6 metric tons per hectare. With RCEF, the estimated yield is now 4.0 metric ton per hectare, or an additional income of 7,000 pesos per hectare. And this is also seen in official statistics. Prior to the series of typhoons and flooding last year, in the third quarter, rice production was 3.5 million metric ton, or a 15.2% growth, one of the highest growth that we have seen in our history. Number seven is on human capital development. And the primary reform here is the universal health care law. 
which is allowing us right now to help people uh, fund or finance their out uh, of um, their um, pandemic um, health needs. When the reform is fully implemented, we would see an, an increase in the primary care drugs available for free from 18 to 120. Uh, the health conditions that are covered from seven to unlimited, and also to reduce the out-of-pocket pay from as high as 90% to a fixed fee, which is basically the membership. On number eight, science and innovation, we have four important uh, achievements. The first is the Philippine Innovation Act, which we intend to maximize to allow us to sustainably become an upper middle income country because innovation is what drives upper middle income countries growth and to help us prepare for high income country status. So instead of using someone else's ideas and we just assemble the product, our objective moving forward is to create those ideas through research and development within the Philippines. And the CREATE law will allow us also to incentivize the industries that will bring us to the future. Number two is our 19-notch improvement in the Global Innovation Index from 73rd rank to 54th rank in the latest survey as of 2018. We have also established the Philippine Space Agency and we have launched the largest satellite tracking antenna or PEDRO in 2020. And the House has approved the creation of our own Virology Institute. And we hope that this will become law very soon. On number nine, on social protection, the key reform here is the national ID. And we will use this to improve the services and improve our targeting of support to all Filipinos. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have adopted a three-step registration process to comply with the minimum health standard. Step one started in October 2020, and step two started in January 2021. Under step one is the house to house or online collection of demographic data and the setting of an appointment schedule. By April 30, we will be launching the online system where Filipinos with access to a mobile or a laptop or a computer can register themselves and their family. Once registered in step one or the collection of demographic data, we proceed to step two, which is the visit to one of the fixed registration centers available in all provinces where your biometrics will be captured and you will be able to open a bank account uh, if you do not have a bank account. And the step three, which we will begin starting May 2021, is the issuance and delivery of the national ID card to those who successfully registered. From zero registration a year ago, we are now seeing 30 million Filipinos registered to step one of the national ID as of April 17. So 30.7 million Filipinos have already been registered. And this is 104.6% of our April 30, 2021 target. In other words, we have achieved or exceeded our target by 4.6%. And we will continue to do so in the safest possible manner, visiting the low-income households to collect this data instead of having them go to the registration center and fall in line. We are also advancing our step two registration. And as of April 17, we have already registered 4.4 million to step two. Step two is slower because people have to go to the registration center, fall in line, but because they have already given their demographics, it is not a long wait. They will be uh, giving their fingerprint and iris scan and also a photograph. And as of April 17, we are 117.7% of our target. In other words, we are also advanced. We are also doing this in a very calibrated, gradual, and safe approach so that we will not uh, be spreading the virus in the registration center. An important achievement of this step two is that 42% of those who registered opened a bank account with the land bank. Of the 4.4 million registrants of step two, 
1.859 million open a bank account. And our target by the end of the year is for every family, there must be one bank account. There are three important priority use cases for the Philippine Identification System or the National ID. The first is financial inclusion. Every time a Filipino re uh, registers for step two in the registration center, there is a land bank desk where the person can automatically open a bank account on the spot. And our target is that all families will have a bank account by the end of 2021. The second is our support to the COVID-19 vaccination uh, distribution, where the registry can be used for the general population or the priority C group uh, when they register. Uh, they can be that data can be used for their queue in the general queue of the vaccine distribution. And finally, to have a more targeted way of giving social protection subsidies, such as the present uh, social amelioration program, so that the amount goes directly to the bank account and minimize uh, leakages and mistargeting. The priorities in the final year of the administration are as follows. We are working closely with Congress to enact 12 important measures by June of 2021. The Legislative Executive Development Advisory Council, or LEDAC Execom, has agreed on a common legislative agenda. And of that long list, there are 12 priority measures targeted to be passed by June 2021 or before the adjournment of this session. The first one is a passage of the guide bill. That is the one you see in red, which will allow us to help more small businesses and large businesses through liquidity or equity support. The second set is a series of tax and fiscal measures that are colored blue, beginning with the package three of the Comprehensive Tax Reform Program or the Valuation Reform Act and package four or the Passive Income and Financial Intermediary Taxation or PFITA. Then the next three are the opening of the economy, uh, such as the amendments of the Public Service Act, the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, and Foreign Investment Act. All of these intend to increase our foreign direct investment so that we can attract the best technology, capital, and innovation to complement the skills of Filipino and create more and better jobs. Number seven is the Rural Agriculture and Fisheries Development Financing System or the amendment to the agri agro law to also help our farmers compete better. Number eight and nine, the one colored in yellow, are our support to the healthcare system to improve the foundation to prepare better for future pandemics, including the creation of a medical reserves corps and the creation of the Disease Prevention and Control Authority Act. And finally, we also have a series of fiscal and tax measures to also help fund our recovery, including the ones on POGO, uh, on online uh, cockpits, and also strengthening LGUs uh, in the use of their uh, ERA. So these are the priorities by June 2021. Finally, let me talk about the prospects of our recovery. Our recovery is slated uh, starting this year, and we would achieve pre-pandemic level in 2022, middle of 2022. And all of these are needed to prevent long-term scarring and productivity losses. The Development Budget and Coordination Committee has approved a 6.5 to 7.5% growth this year and up to 10% growth in 2022. Although the recent imposition of ECQ and MECQ may be lower, uh, may lower our growth uh, estimate, but we are still early in the year and there is ample opportunity to catch up. And the enablers of our recovery are along three pillars. The first is the safe reopening of the economy once the spike is over, managing the risk better instead of having everyone put in quarantine when we can target the areas of highest risk. The second one is the timely implementation of our recovery package. And the third one is a timely implementation of our vaccination program. 
On the first, the reality today is the virus is not going to go away easily. And globally, we have seen a second, third, or fourth spike. And we will have to live with this virus. That is why we all have to work together to adhere to the public health standards. This is the only way for us to gradually and safely open the economy. If every Filipino will cooperate and practice the minimum health standard of washing hands, wearing a mask when going out in a face shield, staying at home unless to work or to buy essential goods and services, and even wearing a mask at home if you have family members who are older or with comorbidities. 95% of our success lie uh, in your personal behavior. The second one, this will allow us, therefore, to open the economy safely and gradually. The second one is to implement fully in, and even accelerate our package of recovery programs, including Bayanihan 2, which continues to be implementable until middle of the year, the CREATE law on the lowering of taxes and the granting of more performance-based and targeted incentives, the implementation of the FIS, which addresses liquidity problems of firms, the immediate passage of GUIDE, which will address solvency problems of firms, the acceleration of our Build, Build, Build program, and the implementation of our 2021 budget. All of this together with our recovery and emergency programs in 2020 amounts to some 15.4% of GDP in both fiscal, monetary, and financial support. And finally, is the acceleration of our vaccine uh, deployment program, uh, which we very much hope supply will come soon so that we can continue to vaccinate the uh, critical sectors of our society. These are the achievements in the first five years of the administration and our program of priority for the remaining year. Thank you very much.